we start with your basic biographical information? Uh, how did you get involved in the work that you're doing? Well, I, uh, I was born almost 56 years ago in Newark, New Jersey. And part of what I liked about growing up there, I, I was there till I was uh, a little more than 13, was there was a lot of activity in the park and a kind of small, not particularly violent, but street gang activity, what I think pre-teenage boys do. And that was my first liberation from the domination and tyranny of my family. My, my brothers, I had two older brothers, later on a younger one, but they would uh, beat up on me sometimes and so on. So the park life and the street life was very nice for me. And probably that formed one of the bases of my interest in street performance, performances of all different kinds. In a more formal sense, I became interested in the theater when I was a teenager. I worked on the radio. I liked that kind of acting because I didn't have to memorize anything. Later on, when I went to college, I began to do a lot of writing, which I still do. Creative writing, journalism, and to a certain degree, theater reviews at that point, at Cornell University from 52 to 56. But I also became involved in what later became known as the Civil Rights Movement, then the Freedom Movement, then the Anti-Vietnam War Movement, all of which one segued into another. But uh, so when I became a little more familiar with certain aspects of Afro-American culture, uh, church culture, uh, singing, the use of demonstrations, sit-ins, all these kind of things which uh, were, let's say, theatricalizations of situations, a theater as political force. Um, that, I, I was involved in that, and that interested me a great deal also. I wasn't a scholar yet. And at the same, at about the same time, I began directing plays, because I liked manipulating people, ideas, objects. And uh, that is, manipulating means playing with, rearranging. And I ran a summer theater in Provincetown, Massachusetts in 1958 for, at the end of the summer. And then I ran it again in 59. In 60, I went into the Army. And part of what I did in the Army was to direct plays. And that was the first time I was uh, directing plays of people who I didn't really know. I mean, while I was running the theater in Provincetown, it was a group of friends. And my Army experience convinced me that I wanted to have a career as a writer as a theater director and as a teacher. I like teaching. And I've been able to fulfill all those. Uh, if you want a little more detail, at about that same time, as I was coming out of the Army, going into graduate school to finish my PhD, I went to New Orleans, which has a very lively street life, not only Mardi Gras, but during much of the other part of the year as well. And in New Orleans, I became involved in both civil rights and anti-Vietnam War stuff. And I became also aware of uh, happenings and uh, movement among visual artists to get the art off the wall. I was one of the founders of a group called the Free Southern Theater, which in, during Freedom Summer in 64 performed plays in rural Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama. And uh, that was uh, both exciting and rough and dangerous. And we did a variety of plays ranging from Pearly Victorious, which is a kind of spoof on black-white relations from a black point of view. It's by a black writer to Waiting for Godot, and The Rifles of Senora Carrar, which is uh, one of Brecht's Lehrstücke, Plays for Learning, a revolutionary play about armed revolutionary struggle. Um, I also became, when I finished my PhD, editor of TDR, which I'm editor now still, but there was 18 years in there when I was an editor. But during the time I edited it in the 60s, it became a spokes vehicle for um, experimental performance and performance theory. Um, at about the same time, I started a group with two others called the New Orleans Group, which tried to use environmental theater techniques, uh, which is a phrase I, I coined in 67 or 68 to describe a certain kind of theater where it doesn't take place in the proscenium, it uses found spaces or uh, completely reconstructed or transformed spaces, involves audience participation and so on. Uh, and we did two pieces, the New Orleans group, one called 466 in April of 1966, which was a happening, and a, an environmental theater version of UNESCO's Victims of Duty, uh, Victime de Debois, uh, in 1967. In 67, I left Tulane, where I was teaching, 
and went to NYU, where I've been ever since. Uh, at about the same time, in 66, I published an article called Approaches to Theory Criticism, which has just been reprinted, actually, which details my views at that point about the relationship between play, game, sports, theater, and the other major genres of art performance, dance, and music, uh, and ritual. And that is a theory that I still investigate and continue to investigate. While I was in New York, and when I came to New York, I founded a group that became known as the Performance Group. And we did a series of, uh, I think, important works at the Performing Garage, which is an experimental theater in Soho, Dionysus in 69, Mother Carriage Commune, et cetera. And out of the Performance Group came the Worcester Group, which performed here in Toronto. Actually, the Performance Group also performed in Toronto, but that was in the early 70s. The Worcester Group performed here last year. And they're the same people that I worked with in the a Worcester group, some changes, but fundamentally the, some of the same people who took over the group when I left in 1980. And I did with them from 67 and eight to 80 a series of experimental performances which were played in New York and all over Europe and actually in uh, India as well. And uh, the Worcester group has continued in their own way a certain kind of investigation of environmentalism but more moving towards deconstructive theater and the disarrangement of texts. At about the same time, starting in the 70s, I began to make frequent trips outside of the Euro-American culture area, particularly to Asia. I've spent a lot of time in India particularly, but also in other places in Asia. And I directed Cherry Kabagicha, which is Cherry Orchard, in Hindi with a National School of Drama repertory in India, which is not a school theater, but a, their professional national theater. And last spring in May, I directed a, a Chinese play, Tomorrow He'll Be Out of the Mountains, in um, Chinese at the Shanghai People's Art Theater, and I was evacuated because in the midst of the rehearsals, the Tiananmen Square uh, freedom movement occurred, and I, to a certain degree, took part in it in Shanghai in one march, and then the massacre of June 3rd, 4th, and the play performed for 12 performances, which then stopped. Interestingly, the playwright, Sun Wei Ju, is in Toronto. He teaches at York, but he's about to leave to go to teach at the University, at the California State University. But we had known each other for a few years before it was decided that I would direct this play. And uh, along with the artistic work, I do a lot of scholarly writing about performance theory. So that's uh, probably more than you bargained for. It is. Uh, but you talked about play, game, sports, and rituals. So yeah. Perhaps you could talk fully on, on these kinds of issues. What kind of well, you see, the, the, the theater is just a genre of performance. Performance is the uh, large. Uh, uh, area, and performance really is what I call twice behave behavior, or planned behavior, or restored behavior. In other words, what's a performance is behavior that is not for the first time, it's for the second to the nth time. We're in a situation now, we're sitting in this room, there's some halogen lights over there against umbrellas, there's a potted plant over here, there's a kind of a backdrop, and, uh, the, uh, and there, we're sitting on a rug, and I'm sitting on a chair, and the, the impression is that it should look like uh, I'm not exactly at home, but I'm not exactly in a formal situation. I'm just having a conversation. But as we know, because of the camera right there and the, the monitor and the lights and so on, that this is a studio. This is a prepared performance. So this is not really the same kind of conversation I would ordinarily have in my house, et cetera, e because the presence of the camera automatically puts a kind of frame around it. Well, lots of our behaviors are this way. Um, it doesn't have to be a strictly theatrical situation to elicit a theatrical behavior. Uh, you are in a uh, situation where you're off camera, so the, uh, you're the off camera interviewer. If, however, this was a network TV program, it would be important to show you because you would be the consistent performer from story to story. And although apparently the stories would be about the me's, the different people you're working with who were victims of disasters or interesting people or what have you, actually what's being sold is the you. So you are the kind of receiver of the, of the performance. But in academic television, which we're in now, you want to give the illusion that I'm the center of it and so that you keep yourself off camera. So I, I investigate uh, that kind of uh, convention, uh, the conventions of various performing genres. Now, sports are the same way. In other words, sports are very closely related to dramas. They, uh, they use games rather than uh, pre-written narratives but they also tell a narrative of uh, uh, contending forces and act it out before a critical and yet appreciative uh, public. 
in which a certain, let's take baseball, there are two dramas being enacted, the immediate drama of the particular game. Are the Blue Jays going to win? Are they going to lose? And then the longer drama of the season. And that longer drama of the season is also enclosed in a still longer drama of the statistics, in other words, the collection of seasons. But then you could go and connect uh, baseball to ritual. You could say that the game originated to, a, uh, although it was based on English stick games, and there are lots of stick and ball games around, it was originated in urban uh, United States at the end of the 19th century. And therefore, it wanted to give to working class people in urban setting the illusion of the countryside. So it was made in a park, but the park was an enclosed park. In other words, you sculpted out of urban turf a place where the walls would, it would make a barrier between the ur urbanness and this pastoral setting. Then you constructed a game which follows a, a very classic ritual pattern, the perilous journey. It's interesting that the person who's at bat has a weapon, and through that weapon they can hit this kind of magic uh, ball, this thing that, that if it's uh, caught puts them out, but if it can elude, it's kind of the extension of the power, the phallic power of the uh, batter, if it can elude this other team or the adversaries, the person then can leave home, which is a perilous journey. There are only a few places that that person is safe, at these little islands, their first base, second base, third base. And the idea is through that person himself and his teammates, who are also going to assist him, but in a rule-bounded way, to get him back home safely. So that this is a classic uh, uh, a perilous journey, mythic uh, journey, in which uh, when they come home, then the, the, uh, everybody, they're all, everybody's Ulysses. If you're at bat, you want to come home, and, you're, and your fans welcome you. Uh, it's perilous unless you're able to hit the ball out of the park. In other words, into the stands, which is out of the grassy area, in which case you, in a certain sense, transcended the geography of the place, and therefore you can trot. You don't have to run. There's a kind of suspension of actuality or of reality, which permits that person to run around and to uh, arrive home safe at any point, never in danger, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can analyze these uh, down the line. You could then say that football, on the other hand, is a ritual performance in the sense that it is really uh, takes the industrial class system and codifies it, that there are linemen who are really lower class and who are uh, in the pits, and then there, it builds up to the, to the ends, the quarterbacks. But actually, the real controlling force is the coach. The, the coach or the manager in baseball is not quite so important. It's the individual batter. It's an older, more pastoral view. But the coach in football actually sends in the plays. The coach is a kind of the corporate boardroom who is controlling even the apparent heavy-duty players, the behind-the-scenes person who is on, on the scenes. And even behind the coach stands the media, which actually is behind both. And it's not accidental that this corporate game was first played at colleges. It wasn't a poor person's game. Baseball was a poor person's game. But football was a corporate game because it teaches corporate manners. It teaches corporate etiquettes. It teaches a sub submission to hierarchy and so on. And that it still attracts, at least in the stands, upper middle class spectators. It's much more expensive to go to a football game. You have to buy a season ticket. It's a big deal. Baseball game, you can still drop in, plunk down a few bucks. It's still a much more popular game. They're both mass. But one is upper middle class mass, in a certain sense, um, in the field. Through media, ordinary guys can get involved at the bars. But baseball is a much more democratic and older vision of things. So that's what I do. I analyze. I can take many different things. Do you have an analysis of hockey, by any chance? Well, hockey is a, uh, I don't know it as well, but hockey is institutionalized combat, you see. They're armed with a stick and the puck, but the idea, a hockey game without a fight, without an assault on the rules. So it's a kind of, uh, it's a much more uh, end of capitalism kind of game. In other words, football emerges again in the 19th and early 20th century, gets institutionalized in the 20th century baseball. Hockey, although it's an older game, its value system and its institutionalization is quite a bit, bit later. And as it involves mayhem and this kind of bloody fighting, it, it, it is about the, the, how far you can break the rules and how far you can even intimidate those who enforce the rules. Nobody would assault an umpire uh, at f a baseball or a ref at uh, uh, football. But in hockey, you're almost to professional wrestling. You're in the sense where the, where the rule makers themselves, their rules are in question, and they are not exactly assaulted, but they're ignored. While you move over to professional wrestling, they're actually assaulted. And that becomes highly theatricalized in the sense that in, uh, in uh, hockey, th these guys are really engaging in this combat. In football, they're engaging in simulating combat. And so that, I mean, not in football, in uh, wrestling. They're simulating uh, combat. And therefore, the role playing, 
Rick Rude, uh, uh, Hulk Hogan, it becomes very, very important. We don't think that Hulk is really Hulk. He's exaggerating parts of himself, or Rude is really Rude. That's a role that he's playing quite clearly, like a theatrical role. But we do think that Ricky Henderson is Ricky Henderson. These baseball players are supposed to be what they're supposed to be. And actually, as they earn more and more money, the public gets uncomfortable because then they are quite clearly revealed as business persons, which they are, interested in their own careers rather than in their team's welfare, and that's not supposed to be. In football, it's obvious that they're egomaniacs interested in their own career, but, but their persona uh, separates them from themselves. Now, I am also very interested in rituals, not only in our own culture, but in other cultures, uh, Native American cultures, Asian cultures. I've done a lot of work in that area as well. Right, about Asian culture, the kinds of rituals that you study, can you speak more? Well, uh, there isn't a really strict distinction in many Asian cultures between ritual and entertainment. Whereas the tension between entertainment and ritual or efficacy is there in Western performance as well, but in Asian performance very clearly. Uh, an efficacious performance is a performance that is supposed to do something. In our own cultural marriage would be an efficacious performance. You don't have a marriage ceremony in order to signal or mark a marriage. It is the marriage. And the signing of the papers, the exchange of the vows, uh, so that when you enter that performance uh, as a bride or as a groom, when you leave it, you're different. Uh, if you're the officiator, the judge, or the rabbi, or the priest, you don't change, but you affect the change. And then there are spectators, but those spectators are usually interested spectators. They are in a certain sense, enforcing and seeing that the marriage goes through. They're not just neutral witnesses. They're also cheering, but they're cheering for what very often happens in ritual, uh, the people who are, if not opposed to each other, at least not necessarily joined to each other to be joined, or people moving from one status to another. Another uh, famous kind of ritual is a funeral ritual. In other words, dying isn't enough. You have to socially die. You have to go through uh, the ritual of a funeral to uh, ha help the people around you to accept your death and for yourself to move categories from being among the living to being among the dead. And the funeral is this liminal area where you're not quite alive, you're not quite dead. The great example of that would be, of course, the display of the corpse, who is made to look as lifelike as possible but put into a situation where they have to be dead. It would be one thing to have the corpse in the coffin where they look lifelike but are dead. But in some cultures, they have the corpse sitting in a chair or in a, life, more, a much more lifelike situation. And so that their position is even more am, ambivalent about whether they're living or dead. Now, in India, I studied uh, particularly a, a 31 day ritual play called Ram Lila, which tells the story of Rama, who is one of the incarnations of Vishnu, a culture hero to many uh, Hindu Indians. And uh, I studied it as it uh, is enacted as a, a spectacular performance uh, using the streets of uh, a town called Ramnagar as the actual stage settings for the journeys of Rama, for his coronation, his interrupted car, his birth, his childhood, the time he battles with the demons, the uh, interrupted coronation, his exile to the forest, his meeting of saints and sages and uh, demons and uh, giants and his war against Ravana, the ten-headed demon king of Lanka, who kidnaps his wife, Sita, the move across all of India from North India down through to a place called Rameshwaram and then across the sea to Lanka, which is now Sri Lanka, the war in Lanka, and the return to North India to Ayodhya. All this is acted out in 30 square miles of, or, of 30 square kilometers of the town of Ramnagar where certain actual spots are Ayodhya, are Lanka, are Panchavati, are different uh, uh, settings. So it's uh, environmental theater and, and uh, ritual theater of a great scale. Now the patron of this performance is the Maharaja of Benares, whom everybody calls Maharaja uh, as if he's still a king, but of course he hasn't been a king since 47 when uh, the uh, kingships of uh, India were abolished, it became a secular democracy. But the continuation of this performance, in a certain sense, underwrites his authority. He is the Maharaja for the month that Ramlila is performed. And Ramlila uh, supports his Maharaja, even as his money and state grants support the performance of Ramlila. And he's, he is a Maharaja during the rest of the year also. But at Ramlila time, he is displayed as the principal spectator on his elephant, or in his Cadillac, or on his carriage, watching this Ramlila being performed. And even as he hires the boys who play the gods, these gods, Rama, 
uh, uh, Lakshman, Shatrugna, Bharat, Sita are thought by many in the, in the crowd to actually be incarnations because the Indians have the uh, felt notion of transubstantiation, that the, that the god is manifest in the being of these boys, not just represented by them. In the same way that a believing Catholic would say that in the uh, uh, communion wafer and wine is the flesh and, Christ of, uh, flesh and blood of Christ. And as uh, people at Lourdes and other places have seen the Virgin Mary, which is a, an occasional uh, appearance. But in Ramlila, the darshan or the vision of these boys who are playing these gods, in, including the female god Sita, is not an occasional or accidental um, epiphany or manifestation of the gods, but a regularly expected one during this month. So people from all over India come to this place to watch this performance. But the performance is not only, it's even more interesting, it's not only performed in this one place. This is the most spectacular and the longest and most lavish because it's under the auspices of the Maharaja Banaras. But there must be 15, 20,000, 10,000 Ramlilas being performed all over Hindi-speaking North India at this season. Some of them lasting two days, some 10, some 20, only this one lasting 31 days. But at each of these, boys perform these roles and when they show themselves, they're felt by the people close to them to be the darshan or the, the, the uh, incarnation. To, they have a darshan, a look at these murtis, these temple images who are living flesh, who are the gods that we from the West would say they represent. Uh, now the people come to these performances in order to be entertained, in order to hear a story well told, well told again. They come as uh, religious devotees in order to worship the gods that during the rest of the year are just uh, statues or icons or uh, pictures, but at this time are living flesh. They come to see friends. They come, uh, they come to take time out from their yearly routine so that they have a celebratory time which we kind of do, you know, two days a week, Saturday and Sunday in a two-week vacation, but this is a kind of uh, older style celebratory time when time in a certain sense is open, the ordinary calendar, this uh, celebration or street time comes in. They come to eat the uh, snack foods in a, in a very organized way that rich people who usually don't eat what is called chop, uh, cheap, uh, fat, traditional Indian fast foods, not McDonald's type, but other deep fried foods because it's lower class eat, can at this season publicly eat chop. And poor people who couldn't afford sweets save up some money uh, to eat uh, rich people's sweets. So there's a kind of inversion. A Bakhtinian, Mikhail Bakhtin, wrote that in festivals things are inverted. So there are different kinds of inversions that go on. So that this kind of performance is ritual, it's entertainment, it's social occasion, it's political. In other words, affirming the power of a particular kind of uh, a Hindu ruler. It has also been connected with Hindu nationalism because. Gandhi took certain key songs and images from Ramlila to use in his struggle against the British because Rama is regarded as that avatar of Vishnu who was the great king of all the Hindus of all India. It's a mythic king, but one of these who represents what's called Ramraj. The Ram king is the just rule of a just ruler so that he used that to throw out the British and bring in Ramraj so that this has a political reverberation as well. I think our own theater in uh, North America and Western Europe very often is reduced in its scope to being uh, entertainment and commodity rather than having this wider scope. Uh, sports are more popular because it has that kind of wider scope. Popular entertainments are popular because it, they don't just serve the elitist uh, function of uh, kind of philosophical approach of life or the appreciation of beauty, but it's also a place to chop down some sausages, drink some beer, meet some friends, get involved. In words, it has these multivocal, many, many functions at the same time supporting a kind of celebration in which the performance or the theatrical or the dramatic part is a kind of core or armature through this celebration. But when you strip away the celebratory aspects and say just concentrate on the art, that's interesting and it should continue, but it's necessarily going to be elitist. Not many people are interested in that kind of austere experience. Uh, just going back, you used the term uh, liminal. Uh, can you yeah. go back and... Uh, well, liminal is a term uh, first used by Arnold van Gennep, a Belgian folklorist at the turn of the century. He wrote a book which was published in 1908 called Le Rite de Passage, Rites of Passage. And that's a very, you know, it's a term that everybody kind of knows. And in this book he said that uh, rituals, or especially rites of passage, rites which change people's status, have three phases. 
the uh, separation phase where a person is taken from their own old status, but also taken from their old place, taken from their old time, their accustomed place and time. You have to do it in a special enclosed place and time. And the liminal period, the, which means limin, like uh, on a door frame, that which is not in this room or in that room, but between rooms, so this in-between time and space where during this in-between time and space, the work of the ritual takes place. In other words, whatever it is that the ritual is going to do in an African or N Native Australian society, maybe the person is going to be circumcised or tattooed or marked. In our society, maybe they're going to wear a ring or they're uh, going to, let's say, in a long-range liminal space, they're going to go to college and get a degree. Uh, but the work of the liminal period is to change them, and it's bounded off from ordinary life. College does function that way for us. I mean, it's supposed to be on a campus, separate from regular life. You're no longer living with your parents, but you're no long, not yet living alone. I mean, the traditional view of it. So you're in between. You're really, uh, from the point of one point of view, you're alone. And on your own, from another point of view, you are still parentally protected. And the job of education literally is to lead you out. That's what it means in Latin, ed, to, to lead from one place to another. Lead you out of one way of thinking and acting into another and to prepare you for participation in so-called mature or developed social life. But in, in other cultures, these initiations may be much more intense and, uh, and bounded in time. But at any rate, this liminal period is where the work of the ritual takes place. And then at the end of the liminal period, you're reintegrated or re-aggregated into the society, but as a different kind of person. You're either an adult when you were a child, or you're married when you were single, or you're dead when you were alive, or you're a king when you were just the crown prince, what have you. All of these things are the, the work of the ritual, which m affects that change, the liminal period. Now, Victor Turner, a very uh, great uh, theorist of uh, ritual, and uh, happily a friend of mine, he died in uh, uh, at the age of 63 in 1983, I believe, or somewhere around there, um, he took Van Gennep's ideas and elaborated them in a series of books, The Ritual Process, Dramas, Fields, and Metaphors, From Ritual to Theater and Back, and developed the notion of the liminal and the what he called the anti-structural work of ritual. In other words, we often think of ritual as enforcing social norms, of uh, uh, continuing that which is uh, conservative. But Turner showed by analyzing Haight-Ashbury, which was a, the hippie section of San Francisco during the uh, early 60s, and analyzing Ndembu or rights, rights of African uh, people that he lived with in Uganda and others, that ritual can also have an, an anti-structural or a creative process, that it can break down accepted norms, that it can be used in revolutionary, rebellious ways. In this sense, he joined with Bakhtin, and he uh, uh, clearly developed the ideas of, of Van Gennep in a ways that Van Gennep uh, might not have seen, and also Durkheim, Emile Durkheim, who also had a, a kind of constitutive or uh, a conservative view of the functions of ritual. So Turner didn't deny those, but said that there's a whole other part where illicit, subversive, subjunctive behaviors, excuse me, are allowed and encouraged, and where the persons are, 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 can critique the dominant social discourse. And he said that when this occurs in developed uh, uh, industrial societies, they should be called liminoid rather than liminal, like liminal, but not exactly like liminal. And he included in these the genres of arts, uh, theater, dance, music, which he called liminoid phenomena. They are related to liminal phenomena. They may be even elaborations of things performed during the liminal phase in earlier cultures, but now they take on their own life and they can be crit critical uh, so that the shaman, let's say, who is, might be a, a rather strange figure in a traditional society is directly related to the artist, who also may be a strange figure. And some artists support the dominant culture, but some artists can be very critical of it through their work, not through uh, intellect. So he developed this relationship between liminal and liminoid. And the notion that re-aggregation is not the only outcome of this. You can also have schism. And from this, Turner developed his social drama model, that the social dramas take four phases, breach, crisis, redress of action, re reintegration, or uh, schism. Uh, for example, to use Canadian social drama, Meech Lake, well, I'll analyze that in terms of a Turnerian social drama. So Turner said that, and he and I developed this theory to a certain degree together, or elaborated it together in its later phase, that there's a loop 
but where aesthetic or rhetorical devices shape the behavior of social drama or political action, and political or social actions shape the kind of content or subject matter of, of aesthetic dramas, but that these are not in a mimetic, they're not imitating each other, but they're in a very dynamic kind of Mobius loop, infinity loop way. Now if we look at Meech Lake as a, as a Turnerian social drama, uh, with the liminal phase being the redress of action, the breach, which is a pre-existing kind of uh, fault in the social structure, would be that uh, Canada was colonized by French and by English who didn't like each other, and they fought wars, and this post, uh, this colonial situation got incorporated into a nation which called itself by one name, but re which really did have distinct cultures and distinct histories and distinct colonial pasts. And uh, the uh, Middle East part of Canada, Quebec, was uh, colonized and had the French culture, and rather the, and the maritime provinces and the West had an uh, English colonial culture. We'll leave out the native cultures, which I think have a very great claim in this, but they're the pre-existing cultures, and the French and English agreed that they should be uh, exterminated or at least uh, uh, shoved aside, so that at that level, uh, both the French and English agreed against the Native Americans who have a great claim. So we believe that aside for the moment. So the breach is this inherent fault in the tectonic sense in Canadian society between the French and the English. The crisis occurs, uh, oh, and let's compare it to Romeo and Juliet, which is going on now in a uh, French and English production, because this is an aesthetic structure. The breach in Romeo and Juliet is the animosity between Montagues and Capulets. Uh, that's uh, similar to the French and English. In other words, there's some pre-existing thing, we don't necessarily know what it is in Romeo and Juliet, that puts these two families on edge. Now the crisis in Meech Lake comes when the Quebec people say, we want out. Uh, okay, we want our own country. In other words, they, 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 they no longer agree to the post-colonial settlement that there'll be one country, and they want their own country. Then the redress of action is how you accommodate this desire, uh, either by stamping it out, by trying to assign Meech Lake, which is saying that there's going to be one country but two distinct cultures and so on. Uh, uh, but it's very difficult because redress of actions lead to their own consequences and crises. The, the crisis, in other words, the crisis is what puts the fat in the fire. The crisis in Romeo and Juliet is when Romeo and Juliet see each other and they fall in love. Then the redress of action is how are they going to get their love together and, and, and deal with the animosity of their families. So the nurse has one plan, Friar, whatever his name, John or Lawrence has another plan, et cetera and so forth. And there are all these different things which become complicated by the uh, murder of Tybalt and, uh, all, uh, and the banishment of uh, Romeo and, and so on. But all of that, uh, uh, so the murder of T Tybalt, uh, Tybalt and, the, and the, 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 the double murders and the banishment of Romeo are part of the Montague Capulet thing. That's expected, but it's in dialectical tension to the love between the two young people who must heal the very breach and overcome the very crises that, uh, that their families want them to act out. So you have two kinds of redress of action. Similarly, in the Meech Lake business, you have the dramas and the subdramas, where the pr premiers of, uh, uh, I guess it's New Brunswick or whatever, uh, Wells, what is, what is he premier of? Which? Newfoundland, uh, agrees but disagrees. And the, uh, the Native American in Manitoba doesn't agree. So all of a sudden, the agreement which you watch the drama in the newspapers was all settled, uh, is thrown up an edge and you have a deadline which is so dramatic. You know, it's like, it then becomes uh, like a, a baseball game. You have nine, or a, a boxing match, it's, uh, or a basketball game. It's regulated by time. June 23rd is the end of the game. You can't have a draw. A draw is a loss. So you have all these dramas going on, which are very much influenced by sporting events and, uh, uh, and our, 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 the cultural way of waging these dramas, and also the, the battle of the individualist and the person who can say different things in his home turf than he can in, in Ottawa, which is regarded as a kind of, he was brought there in a liminal space and worked over. But then when he's liberated, he disagrees. He, he's no longer brainwashed, et cetera, and so forth. You see all these dramatic elements. In Romeo and Juliet, it ends tragically. And the, in other words, through almost a farce, you know, she is uh, in a false death, which he, with his adolescent impo impetuosity, thinks is a real death. He's in a real death. She joins him. In the Shakespeare, the two families are reunited by this tragedy. In the production that Lepage and his English-speaking colleague did 
down here at the Harborfront Festival, that line, those lines are cut. They just said it's, this is tragic. So that they're very aware of the French and English schism, and they don't resolve it in their production. In Meech Lake, we'll see what happens. Uh, so uh, this notion uh, of uh, this four-part uh, drama, it was uh, Turner's notion, which I helped uh, elaborate, which he elaborated, we work on, worked on together, and that is that it comes out that the redress of action phase is the liminal phase, in other words, the phase where whatever changes are going to be made are worked out, and then the reaggregation. If Meech Lake is signed, that's one resolution. If it isn't, it's a schism. That's another resolution. But one moves on. The crisis will be dealt with one way or the other. Although if a, if, a, if a schism is threatened very often, says Turner, and I agree, it's thrown back into the redress of action. So I don't think Canada is going to come apart on June 24th if Meech Lake isn't signed, but it'll go back into how do you do crisis management, which is redress of action. So this is the way you can use performance theory to understand social process, social process to understand aesthetic drama, et cetera. How can you use performance theory to deal with the everyday practices, uh, what people do in their everyday Well, you can begin shopping. to understand, as uh, uh, Irving Goffman would insist, that our lives, uh, life isn't like a theater, but there are many theatrical rhetorical devices that is used in everyday life. We have backstage and onstage behaviors. Anybody who's worked in a restaurant it's a very, or, or in a doctor's office knows that's a very clear example. If you have a closed kitchen, then the chaos in the kitchen and the noise and the shouting and the cursing and the sweating, once you pass through those doors, becomes totally different when you're out in front of, as it were, your audience, where you have to serve them and the plate has to be nice and so on and so forth. But we do this in our ordinary day, too. We, we all have our backstage areas and our front stage areas. If we live in a house and it has more than one room, we usually one room is backstage, a little messier and preparatory, and one room is social and more organized, especially if people are coming over. And uh, so you, you begin to learn how you perform your actualities, not to imitate them, but you really form your personalities and your social relations according to rhetorical or theatrical conventions. So as you uh, investigate this uh, more deeply, it's a very nourishing to understand how these processes may work, uh, how you can and do, in a certain sense, act out the emotions of your life as well as live them out, and the, to act them out is not so bad. In other words, uh, the, uh, I think there's a kind of mythos in the West about, quote, authenticity, but authenticity may come from the outside in. Uh, in other words, in the most extreme and artificial is manners and etiquette. etiquette. We don't feel comfortable with it. But on the other hand is the way we present ourselves. Look how I present myself. Uh, I present myself in a way that is uh, a kind of cliche of the anti-professorial, or maybe it's nostalgia, for the 60s, as my wife says, whatever it is, I could present myself in a different way. I could be in the summer jacket, you know, seersucker suit, you know, uh, a professorial in that way, or, or whatever. Um, so we decide how we costume ourselves, and clothes are simply costumes we're very comfortable with. That doesn't make them not costumes. Uh, costumes are clothes that we feel really don't belong, and we're putting on uh, a face. But really, that's a kind of conventional difference. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm quite aware often of how I choose to dress, and sometimes I like to, quote, dress up. I feel very good about it. It makes a different kind of impression, and that's fine. Uh, but we're doing this not only with our clothes, but with our uh, uh, social gestures, uh, with our organization of our intimate lives, how we handle it, well, the messages we put on our answering machines which are immediate presentation to the world. Some people just put, you've reached 813-2174, leave a message, please, boop. Some people put a kind of whole operas on their tapes and uh, long introductions and stories. And th this is a different kind of performance for the world. These are different performances for the world and can be understood uh, rhetorically. I think in an age of information, rhetoric and information management become uh, the means of cultural production, the means of self-production, so that they are to an information world what the means of material production were to an industrial world. How do you disengage uh, ideological? You don't disengage. Why disengage ideology? Everything has also an ideological dimension. I happen to be, to a certain degree, a materialist. That is a kind of uh, upscale, postmodern Marxist. Uh, uh, in other words, not, uh, not a, a lefty of the of the old school, you know, where you sit around with dandruff and argue about armed revolution, but more a, a cultural materialist analysis of late capitalism and how it might develop into something else, 
in a certain sense, a more orthodox Marxist who said that societies had to pass through a bourgeois, have to pass through a bourgeois era, era before they can even begin to think about the socialist distribution of wealth. So uh, uh, ideologies are very much involved in this. And any time you put a frame around a behavior, you realize that there's another frame framing you. So that uh, you, you're aware of that uh, tension uh, of frames within frames. And uh, there's no uh, devalued or objective or neutral statement. But there is a dominant ideology, and sometimes you right. reenact the, uh, the, the scripts of the dominant ideology. Yes. Then how do you create the kind of rupture? Well, uh, you create the ruptures. It's easy for artists because part of our uh, uh, dominant ideology's uh, place for us is to create ruptures that aren't too rupturing. So uh, that's part of the job of the, of the trickster or jokester in any society is to be a kind of uh, person who rips the scabs off the wounds but doesn't plunge a knife to the heart of the society. So that there's, there's dis di differences here. I'm not a revolutionary in the sense that I, wa I would like to see the social order changed, uh, but I also don't want to see uh, an, uh, the kind of armed revolution that would uh, promote uh, a large-scale bloodshed and, and, you, and, and at least in our century has resulted more in the imposition of a different kind of authoritarian order. So uh, that's the position I've come to. But uh, I don't think you, I think we're fooling ourselves. You think you can be completely subversive without being involved in armed revolution. So uh, I think there are gradations here. Uh, I, I, if I were living in South Africa, obviously, I think I would feel differently. If I were a black in South Africa, I would uh, obviously feel that armed revolution has to be not only an option, but the top of the menu, and that there should be some kind of deadline. Uh, living in North America, uh, the oppressions are a, a bit different. I would like to see a reallocation of wealth, et cetera, and so forth. But you can be subversive, you can be critical of dominant things, and you also have to be aware where you participate in them. I think too often at the university level, we, we are kind of uh, house pets. We're paid to be uh, critical of the dominant ideology, even while our economic situation means we're participating in it. I think we have to be aware of that and to what, how, how that limits us. Um, I think a professor can uh, talk radically, that's part of the liberal tradition, can even advocate armed revolution. If a professor picks up a gun, they're going to lose your tenure. So you can pick up a gun, but you have to decide whether you're going to do that or not. And if you ask somebody else to pick up a gun on your behalf, in other words, say, you do the shooting, I'll keep my tenure, I think that's a little bit of bad faith. I think that's a lot of bad faith, rather, not a little bit. So I think that we have to first try to look with a cold eye on what our place is in the social structure. I think more of us are implicated than are, than are not. I think people in the inner cities, people of color, especially in the United States, have very little stake in this and are truly uh, revolutionary potential and, and should be if I were in their situation. And one should, if, if on the other side, I would argue for massive change so that they would have a stake so that they wouldn't be revolutionary. Otherwise, there's going to be a revolution which will be uh, to nobody's great benefit, or maybe it will be to their benefit ultimately if they turn the society around. But they have a real basis for revolutionary anger and action because they don't have any material, any deep material investment, especially if you're a young black male. I mean, there are certain points you get involved, but those ladders of opportunities are not there, and they, they ought to be there, and that's where revolutions take place. Uh, now, should a uh, professor uh, or an artist support that revolution? Yes, I think one should. Should one join it? That's a very tough personal question, which I won't answer for myself on camera. But you can't, I, I think I would only say that to pretend to join it is very bad faith. One final question, and that has to do, again, going back to the original question that I asked is, oftentimes in ritual scripts are written for you. Yes. Uh, how do you begin to write your own scripts if you... Well, first of all, there's usually variations in the way you perform the ritual script written for you, in the same way that any dramatic script is also written for the actors, but it's all the difference in the world whether a, uh, a Brana is performing one role or a uh, Gilgud. Uh, so that the, the, the basic dramatic script may be the same, but the way you act it out is different. But that's quite a, a, a good question about one of the fundamental differences between uh, ritual and uh, non-ritual arts. Ritual arts do have a rather tight script, you often, 
the violation of which is to make the ritual something that it isn't. Uh, sometimes there is room in the ritual, as Turner insisted, for anti-structural behavior, but that is still a place accorded within it. I think one of the things that limonoid art forms do, art forms in modern or modernizing societies, and every culture in the world is now has an aspect of it that's modern or modernizing. And every culture in the world has traditional. In other words, what you can do in the art theater of Toronto is not necessarily what you can do in the Methodist church, even if you're a Methodist. Mm -hmm. So that we all, we all live double or triple lives. Uh, so that in the modern or modernizing role, the artist is uh, assigned the opportunity to be subversive in a much more radical way than uh, the same person could be subversive within a ritual structure. So that although at the frame is still there, it's looser or it's full of holes, and sometimes the people, like in the United States at present, there's a struggle about the National Endowment for the Arts, what they're to pay for, that, that the authorities feel that the, the frame is getting out of hand, they want to tighten it and screw it on tighter, and the artists want to loosen it more. I think that's a real struggle and an important one, and obviously I'm for the looser frame.